Well, Carol, we're walking across this um, liquefaction, the sand that's come up through the soil, and it looks like it's taken over your whole backyard, although you've got a bit of a rid, rid of a bit of it now. Yeah, no, well, um, through here, yeah, um, was the morning of the quake. This was absolutely covered in water. Right. Um, due to all this liquefaction cracks. Yep. That basically went streaming through underneath the house. Yeah. Um, and you can see it just th these mounds of of, uh, of sand, well, mounds sort of, of sand. just stretching off into the distance. Yeah, they just keep going. Yeah. On our whole property, the house side was probably more on the edge of the liquefaction, um, but it didn't necessarily come off any better. No. So it looks like it wasn't the shake that's damaged your house, it's actually the liquefaction, yeah, well, all the stuff that, pushing up underneath it. Well, definitely, that's what our thought is too. It's, mm. it's the liquefaction coming, basically the sand coming from underneath the house partly as well, yeah. which is basically causing the house to have gone on a lean and potentially caused some of its structural damage. Alan Baird has been running the Rural Recovery Group and says the liquefaction is confined to only a small number of country areas, but it is a problem with no quick fix solution as grass trapped under it either dies or struggles to reach the light. It happens where there is sand under the surface and when you've got a high water table, the shaking action actually brings the sand and the water to the top, very much like puddling your feet on, on, on the beach. So it's almost a kind of volcanic thing, isn't it? It sort of erupts up. Well, they actually call them sand volcanoes, so yeah, it is, I guess it's a fair analogy, yes. So are the many farmers that you rural recovery people are uh, talking to have got this problem? There's certainly a number down around this area, right. mainly on the smaller blocks, but of course it's a big issue for them because uh, their smaller blocks are all they've got. Yeah, exactly. So what are you recommending to farmers that they do about with this stuff? Well, we've had a look at a number of methods of getting rid of the sand. Um, really scraping it with some sort of scraper and getting it down to a, a, a layer about 40 centimetres thick. Then you can either direct drill into that, which is not terribly successful, or rotary hoe it or work it and incorporate it into the soil is by far the best method of doing it. As quake-hit farmers get on with their repairs and the rest not affected by the big shake gets stuck into a busy schedule, the question arises, what will this disaster mean for Canterbury's rural economy? Most of the businesses are back up and running. The biggest thing is to engage them from an economic perspective to get them spending again. And I guess that relates a lot to the lag time between um, the insurance companies assessing damage and paying out. I suspect once we start seeing money flowing through from insurance claims, you're going to see some busy businesses. What do you think will be the long-term impact of this quake, remembering that most farmers, the vast majority, for them it's business as usual? I, I think there'll be a couple, couple of effects. The first and probably the most significant is it gives us a chance to readdress our economic drivers and to re-emphasise the importance of our rural economy on our overall economy. And I think the other thing it, it will do is it will accelerate big infrastructural development. In other words, we need to reinvest monies, we need to get on with it, and I'm referring obviously specifically to water. I can see water development being accelerated quite markedly as a result of the earthquake and a need to have a strategic plan forward for the whole region. Well, life will go on as usual in the Canterbury countryside, but for decades to come, the question will be asked, what happened to you? when the big quake of 2010 hit. That ends my field report, but I'll be back in a moment with a special interview with two people from the Rural Recovery Group who have been handling the psychological stress on country people since this quake struck. They have a fascinating tale to tell. Well, what's been the, the human spin-off, the emotional spin-off uh, among farming people from this quake? Well, I think we've only, we've visited about 15 families and uh, there's, a, there's a variation, but certainly there are one or two cases, especially where you've got a lady who's on her own in a farmhouse and her husband died a few years ago. Now she is 
quite stressed and her house is probably going to be demolished. But, um, you know, we've, we've made some um, arrangements for her to get help and we're keeping a close eye on it. Well, which district was most affected from the welfare point of view? Well, in terms of um, uh, welfare, then I suppose uh, the Waimak district, because we've got two farmers there who've got quite a lot of uninsurable damage, um, and uh, it's placing them under a lot of stress. They've had, um, you know, both dairy farmers, and um, because it's uninsurable damage, that they're unsure how they're going to um, finance this. So obviously, we're working really hard. Um, with them to make sure that they do get some help, especially the same sort of help that's available to urban people. I mean, the government made um, a lot of noise initially about helping rural people the same as urban, so um, it's something that's not going to happen tomorrow, but just see when the dust settles how much damage there is in that category, probably, out in the rural area. Well, of course, Diane, as we all know, stoicism is virtually in a farmer's DNA. Um, did you find that that kind of stoicism meant that they were unwilling to call for help? Yes, and, and we knew that. We knew that right from the start, that they were stoic people, uh, very resilient people and very resourceful. So um, a lot of them just got on, got on with it and were more worried about neighbours or um, family in other areas. And yeah, I think we didn't initially see a huge number of um, rural people coming forward. It was mainly the urban in the first couple of days. Uh, a lot of farmers or um, people on rural lifestyles actually found their own alternative accommodation, so we didn't get to know about them. They, farmers went to another cottage on the farm or to relatives or you know, neighbours, and so they just got on with it. Um, whereas you know, we were so busy in those first few days with phone calls from people that we had to rehouse or, or find alternative accommodation. Well, I think you told the meeting that in fact some farmers were so stoical that uh, they didn't want to call for any help because they were too worried that uh, their brothers and sisters down in Southland suffering from the snow uh, were probably more deserving than they were. Well, yes, once the Southland um, event happened, we all felt like that actually. We got, uh, I was saying before, two pallet loads of cake from um, Southland rural women and uh, then the snow hit down there and you know, I felt like putting it all back on a truck and sending it back because the reality is their need was actually greater than ours. We were really lucky with this event. It didn't interrupt farming practice that much. Well, were you able to send aid back down to Southland though? Our um, rural support um, trust in North Canterbury got a whole lot of women out bank baking and uh, there was a, a large amount of baking went down there, two loads in a four-wheel drive vehicle. But just touching on the sto stoic farmers, I had a ring from a farmer out in, uh, near the Highfield Fault. He was having trouble with the U EQC. I managed to bring in somebody in Wellington and would you believe the reason that he hadn't seen anyone he said his claim was under 30,000 when it was actually probably just about a total demolition of his house and he was still living in the house. So that's the sort of thing that you come on and, and you know, have to help. The farmers, are, they just don't like to put their hand up. Well, will there be a delayed reaction, Diane, to, to what's happened to these people uh, in terms of what's going on in their heads? Yep, definitely. And, and we've said that all along, haven't we, Doug? That, um, we really, at the moment, we're just seeing small waves. Um, like last week, we saw a small peak, and that was once school went back. Um, and the general understanding is that it's usually three months from a huge sort of event um, when the emotional crisis really sets in. And we have always said that it would be pre-post Christmas anyway, without even knowing that. So. I think that will be a really trying time for a lot of people. They're going to try and have a normal Christmas. Well, Diane, were there more problems, do you think, with people on lifestyle blocks than those who are commercially farming? Probably for some, um, in some areas, with liquefaction, because it's um, just about covered their entire property. 
So they can't put stock out on another paddock or, um, you know, cultivate that that patch because that might be their entire acreage that gets turned over so and they also have to bring in complementary feeds um, horse feed you know cattle feed that sort of thing which is an extra cost that people may not you know have have those funds sitting around for and of course they're they're in town working a lot of them so they can't be there to look after the property yeah yeah well what's your experience doug well, I think the, the, the talking about the stress level, I mean, uh, it's the farmers, wives and children that um, are going to take a long time to get over this. I mean, for the first few weeks after the earthquake, most children in there, from teens downwards were sleeping with their parents or sleeping under tables, wouldn't sleep upstairs and that sort of thing. And that's going to take a long time to work through that. Now, Doug, you've got one more point that you want to make. Rural support, particularly where, you know, we are always working with people. But to come out here to the Selwyn district and get involved in this, I mean, we had to meet a whole lot of people. I mean, I've met Diane only briefly, um, and a lot of the Selwyn staff are not known to me and of our group. So it's quite an exercise um, working in together, and I think it's been fantastic. I've picked up some new skills in terms <laughs> of getting on with people, and it's been a real pleasure to, to work with Diane. We've had our moments, but we're fine. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I think that's the... It's, the one thing I keep saying I've noticed about this earthquake is that it has brought people together yep. that would never have come together at any other time. And people are actually genuinely concerned for each other. Yep. And it's not just like our relationship with, you know, and the other providers that we work with. It's within our own, you know, building here. You know, you see people and you smile and say hello. Now we actually stop and take time. And it's even happening out in the communities. And that's our special progress report on Canterbury's rural recovery from the big shake. I'll be back soon with another edition of Sector Report. And remember, you can catch up with the programme on our website, country99tv.co.nz. From Canterbury, catch you next time.